Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Liz Lazo on behalf of the National Alliance for HIV Workforce Development and Education. Uh, excuse me, sorry, National Alliance for HIV Education Workforce Development, I apologize, also known as NAHU. We thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Before we begin the presentation, I will briefly provide some background information and go over some housekeeping items. The NAHU is a membership organization of eight regional and two national AIDS education and training centers, also known as the AETCs, that support the AETC program's mission. Established in 2010, NAHU supports the AETCs, a component of the HRSA funded Ryan White HIV AIDS program, which have an explicit directive to build and maintain a well-educated and culturally sensitive health professions workforce that can provide prevention, diagnosis, care and treatment, and medical management for people at risk for and living with HIV. NAHU collaborates with multiple organizations in order to promote and educate the work of the AIDS program. Since 2018, NAHU has been funded by the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry as a partner organization of the Opioid Response Network to address the intersection of HIV and opioid use disorder. ORN was created to support efforts in addressing the prevention, treatment, and recovery of opioid use disorder. ORN provides free resources and technical assistance locally in communities across the United States and its territories. So we, we welcome you to uh, visit the ORN website for more information and or to submit a request for technical assistance. So for today's uh, session, we are offering um, CE. So, so we're offering nursing, social work, and a certificate of attendance. Um, in order to receive credit, we ask that you please complete the uh, post-evaluation survey. It will be emailed to you after today's webinar and will also be placed in the chat towards the end of the session. We ask that you complete it within two weeks. Um, we invite everyone to please complete the evaluation. We appreciate your feedback and in, in helping us uh, decide the next topics um, as we continue our series. The certificates will be emailed to you within two weeks of completing the evaluation. However, if you have any questions, feel free to, to reach out to me. At this time, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Shannon Smith Bernadine. She has specialized in health care for individuals experiencing homelessness since 2007 with expertise in street health outreach teams and medical respite recuperative care for medically frail adults. Her primary focus is on the utilization of sobering centers in lieu of their emergency department and jail for adults intoxicated in public. Building from her clinical and administrative nursing experience and her doctoral work at UCSF School of Nursing, Dr. Smith Bernadine's work currently encompasses three roles, emphasizing health services research, program development, and policy efforts. First, she is an assistant professor at UCSF School of Nursing, specializing in alcohol use disorders, sobering center utilization, and homeless-related research. She is funded through a five-year NIAA grant investigating emergency medical and sobering care collaborations in the care of acute alcohol intoxication. Second, Shannon is co-founder and the first board president of the National Sobering Collaborative, a 501c3 nonprofit aimed at identifying and developing best practices, standards, and education towards the use of sobering centers for the care of individuals with harmful substance use. Lastly, she consults in the development of related programs for communities throughout the United States and internationally. Dr. Smith Bernadine holds a doctorate from University of California, San Francisco School of Nursing, a master's from Western University of Health Sciences, and a bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College. She recently completed a healthcare leadership fellowship with the California Healthcare Foundation. So with that, I would like to go ahead and pass it over to our speaker. All right, great, thank you. And hopefully everybody can hear me okay. I saw a couple of chats going on. It looks like there was audio issues, but everyone's fixed it individually. Um, so I'm gonna start sharing slide at the moment and hopefully, there we go. And I, by the way, if I look over to the side, it's because I have two monitors. And so it's just easier to do that that way. So excellent. Well, it's good to be here today. I'm glad to see all of you. Um, and thank you very much, uh, Liz, for the introduction. And I will go through that quick. Basically, I will, um, and I'm opening up the chat so I can see things as they're going on. 
So FYI, I will not be technically monitoring the chat throughout, but someone is. So if you have any questions, put it into the Q&A ideally, I think I already said that, um, or throw things into the chat. Um, someone's having a hard time hearing the speaker. Uh, is that everybody or is that just one person? If it's everybody, you know, give a wave or something. I'll keep going until I hear otherwise. Um, and so at the moment, let me just double check my audio to make sure. Okay, perfect. My speaker is correct. So I want to give a uh, quick land acknowledgement to the Milwaukee Maloney people. So where I come from, uh, where I'm presenting from at the moment uh, in California, the San Francisco Bay Area uh, was the homeland of the Milwaukee Maloney tribes. Uh, you can read more about it. I put a couple uh, links in there. If you do happen to live either in the Bay Area, uh, you can play, pay your Shumi land tax, which is basically like a property tax to a women-run uh, organization uh, with the Milwaukee tribe. The other option is check out your own areas where you live. You can often pay, it's a small amount of land tax typically to the individuals that technically had unceded land take away from them. So um, take a look at that. I just give a shout out for it. All right. So already the quick intro, but just so you know, I'm a registered nurse by trade. Uh, I've been in this work since 2006. Um, all pros, most of my work has been in the Bay Area. I've also worked in Los Angeles County and a few other counties throughout California, Alameda, Santa Clara, et cetera. Uh, over the years, done a bunch of different things. Most of my work currently is on looking at individuals with alcohol use disorder, primarily individuals who are experiencing homelessness and different interventions for them. A lot of this comes up in the harm reduction realm uh, between managed alcohol programs and sobering centers. And I also do a lot of street outreach, uh, medical respite and ambulance EMS collaborations. So any questions, feel free to shout it out and we'll go from there. So we have a bunch of objectives, which are hopefully listed for something uh, that you all have seen, but basically I'm gonna explain some brain centers, talk about how they work in the system. And then there'll be some conversation, obviously we're looking at individuals with high risk for HIV, high risk for communicable disease, high risk for having bad uh, outcomes related to behavioral health, physical health, et cetera. Uh, and then have a look at sobering centers in your own community. A lot of this will be dealt with in the Q&A section of it. So we're gonna start off with alcohol harm reduction. So harm reduction is something I think a lot of folks know about harm reduction uh, or have heard of it. The most probably prominent one of the, in first person's mind is syringe exchange programs. Uh, and then a lot of work with medication, et cetera. Alcohol harm reduction, I kind of consider us the redheaded stepchild of harm reduction. When you think of recovery, and I know we can't have a back and forth here. When you think of recovery, what does that mean? Just think of it real quick. A lot of folks think, I'll just guess, abstinence. Uh, that may or may not be the case. So I wanted to point out last year, almost a year ago now, the National Institutes of Alcohol, Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism put out a new definition of recovery. And that definition is basically a process through which an individual pursues both remission from alcohol use disorder and cessation from heavy drinking. Next part of it is it can be considered an outcome that they are recovered if this happens and they can achieve it and maintain it over time. And looking at this, the idea of recovery is that someone has the ability to fulfill their basic needs, to kind of live a life that they are aiming to live that's more uh, proactive versus reactionary based on the need to consume alcohol or to get drugs of choice, et cetera. And they ideally have a healthier lifestyle. Nowhere in this definition is the word abstinence. And so just kind of think of that as I go through my talk today, uh, because a lot of folks, and I think the main system in general for care is a lot of folks will not be considered eligible for various processes from surgeries to programs, unless they are willing to and are achieving abstinence, which is full cessation, no consumption of alcohol and or other drugs, depending on what the program or situation is. So just think federal government and a lot of us do not consider abstinence harm reduction. Uh, do not consider abstinence the goal, but abstinence is harm reduction. So how do you reduce harm from alcohol? And I kind of split this off, and this was modified off of some of my colleagues who've done a presentation on uh, managed alcohol programs. If you look at the abstinence-based model, that's on the left-hand side of your screen. That would be the traditional detox, social and medical detox, residential treatment, AKA rehab. Uh, there's 12-step programs, AA, NA, et cetera mandated treatment programs. Uh, and these are abstinence-based. 
any are harm reduction because what's the, what's the best way to reduce harm? One of the best ways is to stop using the thing that's causing you harm um, or do something that would reduce the harm, such as wearing a seatbelt. Harm reduction strategies that are not necessarily based on abstinence would include sobering centers, and we'll talk about those as we go through, but also, you know, housing first programs are not abstinence based. People can consume in their own rooms typically. Moderation management, a lot of individuals, the best way to get them into less harm is to stop those moments when it's more harmful, such as binge drinking. So if you can get them to moderate the amount that one is consuming, that can reduce the harms. And I put here in the middle, the medication options. Most folks call this still medication assisted therapy. I'm personally moving away from that phase because we don't call radiation for cancer, radiation assisted therapy or whatnot. We call it medication. Uh, we call it radiation, we call it chemo, we call it diabetes, medications, et cetera. So it's medication options because sometimes the person is taking them, maybe it's naltrexone uh, for often used for alcohol, buprenorphine, suboxone, et cetera, to reduce the, the amount that they're using. Some folks are using it to try to stop, fully cease. Just kind of keep that in mind as we go through. So now I'll get into the sobering center side of the world. I am always curious, if anyone in the crowd, so if you visited a sobering center, feel free to put it in the chat. Let me know which one you went to, because uh, I've visited many of them, maybe 30 across the country. So a sobering center or a place that provides sobering care, kind of used interchangeably, is a short term for typically four to 12 hours is the anticipated length of stay. And it's an, usually used as an alternative to the emergency department and jail for individuals who are found intoxicated in public. So an individual has been con consuming alcohol, other drugs can be brought into the sobering center and typically they're very low barrier. You don't necessarily need identification. There's no paperwork to fill out. You don't have insurance, et cetera. Uh, it doesn't matter. You can still be brought into the sobering center and stay there. Um, there are typically no restrictions based on documentation either. So I know, I know I've helped at least two communities work to create sobering centers to help bring people who may, may or may not have documentation to be in the United States so that they could go there without going to jail and having uh, interactions with ICE and potential deportation simply from having something to drink at night. These are based in harm reduction for the sobering centers and they provide continual oversight of monitoring. Historically in jails and sometimes in the emergency departments, there was a program called the drunk tank. And that was basically individuals be brought in, put in a room and usually someone would come and check on them in the morning. It was often very low, let's say it's, low client care, low client centered, very, very little uh, engagement and basically an empty room without any monitoring whatsoever. That is not a sobering center. If you have an organization that calls themselves a sobering center and has just a room in the back that no one checks on, not a sobering center. Other things that can be in the same place of a sobering center, and this has kind of came up a little bit with some of our conversations earlier regarding uh, the absence-based, non-absence-based models of care and recovery, a sobering center is not detox. You can get people into detox. The goal of sobering is to keep someone for a short amount of time, a few hours, as an alternative to the emergency department, as an alternative to jail, and to basically kind of figure out from that point what they want to do. They sober up from those acute harms of intoxication. So they're, they're, not, uh, they're not at risk for being assaulted in public. They're not uh, at risk from the weather, from just having an injury actually, but nobody knows it and they're on the sidewalk and they end up having a very negative medical uh, situation and or can pass away. Uh, and so detox, the goal is usually a three-day minimum, is removing all substances from the body. Treatment rehabilitation, again, typically abstinence-based, but there's just a long-term aspect. It's not this four to 12-hour situation. Sober living gets confused a lot. That's usually post-rehab. All Everyone who lives there is all trying to achieve abstinence. Um, and I had a question come through the chat of which sobering centers I visited. I'm going to go through some when I do that later, but I visited sobering centers, about 30 of them between the United States and Canada, everything from St. Louis, Baltimore, three different programs I visited in Texas, uh, 12 in California, Arizona, Oklahoma. I visited one of the newest ones that's going to be coming, uh, New Mexico, uh, one that's coming there. And so I visit a few, we'll, we'll get to see some of them in a little bit. And then managed alcohol, which I don't talk about here, but I do do uh, presentations on. And managed alcohol is actually a program usually based on some residential model. Uh, it could be transitional. They also have ones where it can be 
delivered is where you have individuals who live in housing and they're provided alcohol. Um, uh, visiting out, sorry, I'm looking at the chats. I'm going to stop looking at the chat. This is, a, I'm going to distract myself. Um, I get very excited for conversation, which is why webinars are always weird for me. Um, as a harm reduction effort is managed alcohol where people can get alcohol on a regular dosed basis throughout the day to help them regulate how much alcohol they actually consume. I love managed alcohol too. So looking at sobering centers, uh, usually 18 and older. It's not by drinking age, it's by adult age. Uh, suspected alcohol and drug in, uh, intoxication. And they usually are brought in by, most common is police or law enforcement referrals, sheriff, police, uh, highway patrol. Many programs actually take first offender DUIs, and we'll chat about one of those programs in a moment. Uh, and referring parties uh, include ambulances, depending on the community that they're in. So directly from 911 field paramedics, uh, street outreach teams, crisis outreach teams, uh, clinics, emergency departments will get someone who is intoxicated or maybe had a minor medical need, but they're still intoxicated, such as suturing a laceration. The emergency department will then send someone to the sobering center. Uh, and we try to clear people out so that they do not have uh, any medical conditions. So uh, either assessments done in the field, say an ambulance is looking at somebody, or definitely an intake assessment happens when the person arrives to the sobering center. And the usual things that happen, this is kind of the sample or almost like a day in the life of a sobering center. They're identified in public as being potentially eligible. Referring party will bring them in. And the goal is to make it as easy as possible on the first responders to get this individual inside where they're safer and not in jail and ideally not in the ED if they don't need it. Uh, typically vital signs and then a regular vital sign check depending on what it looks like when they come in. Basic physical assessment. We're not stripping down people out of their clothes entirely unless super rainy, super cold, their clothes are saturated. Yes, get them out of their clothes, put them in sweatpants as every sobering center has like an assortment of clothing closet and will basically pull them out of there. And then usually very quick questions, self-reporting on what did you consume most recently to this visit? So we kind of know what we're looking at here. Did you have marijuana in addition to alcohol? Were you smoking crack? Were you, you, you know, injecting methamphetamines? Whatever it happens to be, we just want to know uh, so we know what to expect. What is your withdrawal history? Does the individual get shakes, tremors? And especially like if they do have very bad alcohol withdrawal, when was your last drink and what does it usually look like? Have you been drinking as much as you usually have? Uh, so we know kind of how to evaluate that throughout. Some programs do do blood, blood alcohol level uh, by breathalyzer. Many do not. And then basically providing a bunch of services. They have access to bathrooms, showers, snacks, clothing, uh, delousing typically if there's any type of head lice or body lice. If the person's experiencing homelessness, we'll see that a lot. Uh, and then throughout their stay, usually screen for what their alcohol use typically is, what their drug use typically is, what they feel about the whole thing, a bit of motivational interviewing, depending on the level of staffing. Otherwise, some nice peer professional uh, conversations. Uh, often me medical professionals on site for registered nurses, EMTs, licensed vocational nurses, uh, and then basically figuring out what's best for the individual at that point. A successful sobering center stay is someone comes in while they're intoxicated, they sober up for a bit, and then they go back out to where they came from. If they don't need or want any other services at the time, if none are available, like there might not be any shelter beds, there might not be any room and detox, that is a successful stay even if they didn't get connected to anything else. However, a sobering center should be connected to all the other community services that are available to help get people into those particular programs. And a lot of the value add of a sobering center is basically looking at reducing the harms of the acute intoxication, helping give those alternate, be, being an alternate destination for some of the other referring parties uh, and getting people out of the systems of care that aren't focused on substance use. What can, that's what we can offer. We offer targeted services for individuals who are using substances in a harmful way. And the reality is, is this might be a long-term severe substance use disorder, or it could be the first time that they did uh, consume a considerable amount of alcohol with their friends at a bar and were found passed out at a bus stop. That has happened many, many times. We've had Uber drivers, Lyft drivers bring people to a sobering center because like, their friends put them in our car, told them to bring them home, and I can't even get out of my vehicle. And they somehow know about a sobering center and will bring them to us. Uh, and then ideally, the community connection is going to come up a lot. 
how do we get folks connected to services that are so high risk yet have a condition that makes it almost impossible for them to engage in conversation. They're intoxicated a lot. They're going to the EDs, they sober up and they're, they're, they have to leave almost immediately. The jail is not giving them a whole bunch of treatment and conversation and motivational interviewing and social work access. So how do we work with a population that they're not gonna be able to fill up paperwork on their own very easily? The Sobering Center can do a lot of that. So here are some examples. And I didn't see anyone say that they visited a sobering center, but if you have, I totally want to know. Um, and if you haven't, and you see a community as I go through this, that you have a sobering center, feel free to reach out. I'll get you in contact with who runs the place, or you can look it up on Google and they will be able to have you come by and do a tour. That by the way, we want sobering center sign. First off, starting a sobering center, nimbyism, not my backyard, uh, comes up a lot. That sign was actually from a protest in a community where the community was like, we need a sobering center. And that was someone at the community uh, protesting. I love that sign because there is some yimbyism, which is the yes in my backyard that happens out there. So San Francisco Sobering Center, my alma mater, that's where I started. I was with the Sobering Center of San Francisco from 2007 to 2017. It's a simple program. You can see on the left-hand side there, we have vital sign machines, a temperature monitor, a little fan for air, uh, oxygen concentrator. If you, if you look really closely, you can see the head of the nurse, uh, Megan, who's sitting in that picture there. That's a clinical station. So she has full visibility of the room uh, and there are standing desks in there that they can stand up also. The dorm on the right-hand side, very simple. Those, the mattresses we use there that we found work, uh, a very waterproof, secure cover, Clients do get blankets and such when they come in. We used to have bottom sheets, but they would often get tangled up in them, but they totally get blankets. We actually have a blanket warmer in the corner, like one you'd see in the emergency department, uh, so they can get warm blankets when they come in. If you're looking to decorate any service, like maybe you're in a different program at the moment, that tree in the background is one of those stickers you can get from like Target. And the staff spent a lot of time as we were opening this new dorm after it had been redone, uh, putting a sticker on the wall. It's gorgeous. It doesn't fall off. Uh, I highly recommend it. One of the reasons that San Francisco, they have two cool things. One, San Francisco is the longest standing program that has been taking from 911 ambulances into their sobering center. Uh, we have been taking ambulances since October, 2003. It's gonna be our 20 year anniversary this year since we opened. And the, I think it, the last count that I was paying attention to was at least 18,000 encounters have come in via 911 ambulance of which less than 3% have any type of issue where they need to go to the medical emergency department or psychiatric emergency department. Just doing a shout out for that. Two different programs that we have is regarding managed, I mean, um, medication management in the San Francisco Sobering Center is we do offer withdrawal management, which is for clients accept into detox and we can give them out of equilibrium for the few hours while they're with us until they get into detox. Because oftentimes there's not a bed until the next day. Uh, we also take folks from the ED who uh, arrange someone to go to detox and we'll hold them all the night, get them to detox in the morning. The second thing is chronic and acute care management. So individuals that come to the sobering center a lot uh, are, they often have some other conditions. So they have seizures related to uh, a seizure disorder for an old traumatic brain, in, um, traumatic brain injury, maybe hypertension, et cetera. And so we can get those their medications when they come in. If they visit us three or four days a week, they're getting blood pressure meds three or four days a week. Or acute infections. We've had folks come in with from rashes. I, we had one gentleman come with a horrible eye infection, but we're not going to admit him to the hospital for that. So we ended up twice as long, but he got his eye drops and he got his meds every time he came in and that eye infection went away. Sun Street is in Salinas in Monterey, California. Cute little rooms there, very similar dorm style. That is a little house in the middle of the neighborhood. It's right across the street from an elementary school, actually. Um, and they have a first offender DUI uh, program. So this is for individuals who are found driving while intoxicated. They didn't crash the car. They got maybe pulled over. They were found in the parking lot, trying to pull out of the parking lot, not very well. Uh, so they can be brought to the sobering center. Will, as I put it on a shout out, this does not relieve them, the individual from arrest. It does not relieve them from all the fines doing the programs, losing their license, all of that will still happen. Instead, however, they go to the sobering center, they're surrounded by peer professionals and they can start having conversations. There's an, an immediate feeder from the sobering center into the DUI program through the Sun Street services. And so these individuals, rather than just going through a court system can actually go through a treatment and uh, motivational interviewing and therapy program through the sobering center itself. 
uh, and they help them and get them right away into that. The Austin Sobering Center. You see, I, I really need to visit and get a better picture on the right. I stole that one from them offline. Um, but so they have two different dorms at this point. You can see kind of the pods on the left, chairs on the bean bags on the right, little coffee cart, uh, kind of some plants, couches. Basically, they used to have, like many sobering centers do, dorms by gender, ident gender identification. However, they switched that to be a stimulant dorm versus a depressant dorm. And so the one that you saw on the left-hand side with the little pods on the ground, that's the more depressant. The They're uh, using opiates, usually alcohol intoxication. People want to lay down, take a sleep. Opiates, sometimes they want to sit up. They could go in the stimulant room if they want to, um, but they also have chairs that they were going to put in. I don't know if they've done it yet into the depressant dorm. Stimulant dorm, a little bit more well lit. Activities to do, couches, they can kind of get up and walk around, walk around, walk around. Um, and they're, they have a triage level, which you see here on your right hand side, which is how the person came in and what type of substance that they're on and how often they do the vital sign monitoring, how often they're basically kind of engaging with the individual, worrying about withdrawal, et cetera, uh, and a lot of different parameters. And of course, at the bottom, the contact and isolation. So do they have anything that looks like it may be contagious? Uh, almost every sobering center has some level of individual room that they can put somebody in. Uh, and so this is a great one here, Mission Street Recovery Center. So say, they're in San Jose. So they have lazy boy chairs. These like the hospital chairs are easy to clean. Uh, you can see a little remote controls on the right hand side. So the person can individually monitor how they want to sit up or down, depending on what they want. Staff obviously will do it for people when they get there. Uh, they don't have to figure out how to use an electric chair uh, when they're while they're intoxicated. And they've got, you see the coffee table at the end. The clients can use that once they're sobering up or the staff can get snacks for the individuals. They have folks kind of divided there by gender. They have also uh, uh, individuals who can come in off of uh, re-entry program. They offer a, uh, sorry, almost forgot to go forward. So they have a, a re-entry service um, that's co-located. So individuals come in out of prison or jail who have something set up for them in community, but they can't just drop in there. They go to the sobering center first and then they get connected. And in addition to their sobering clients, they have mental health and drug triage. And they also have police sheriff drop-offs, which is this one I pointed out here, though this is pretty much the same everywhere. For law enforcement to bring someone booked into jail, that booking, usually the minimum I've heard is 45 minutes. I'm assuming maybe it can happen shorter than that, uh, up to an average of one hour to four hours for officers to go to jail with someone intoxicated and get them into jail. By the way, four hours could be the length of stay they're in the sobering center, but that's another issue. The sobering center, the highest we've ever seen is around nine minutes. Uh, most sobering center police turnaround is between three minutes to seven minutes to nine minutes. So just imagine the public safety ramifications of having officers who can drop somebody off in less than 10 minutes versus 45 minutes to four hours. So that's a huge issue. You can also see here, the blue line is 647F, we call that in California, that is public intoxication. So the number of folks who were brought in for public intoxication has steadily gone down as the one visits to the sobering center have gone up, which is a fabulous thing. The next two services, so this is Rainbow Services. Uh, they offer, uh, so you can see here, it's kind of cute. They've got the chair and uh, the mattress on the floor. There's a lot of debate on beds versus mats on the floor. I'd always use beds. I like them because we had folks come in from ambulances in the San Francisco Sobering Center. So there's also far down a gurney can go and you want to roll the person into a bed. However, for individuals who are coming via police, you don't necessarily have a gurney. If they're laying on a mattress on the floor, if they roll out of bed, it, it's going to be a lot less harm for them. Um, and because of law, which I think we have across the country everywhere, you can't restrain anybody with bed rails on both sides. And so like in San Francisco, we had bed rails on one side and then you put a mattress on the other side so they could only roll off on one side, they could roll onto a mattress. That's how we had done it. I know it's a little quirky thing I'm bringing up, but in the weeds. And then Wellspace in Sacramento. So the things that Kansas City and Wellspace in Sacramento have together, uh, I was leaving seeing there right when a tour of like 16 police officers were coming in for a tour, is they have co-located psychiatric services, both consider themselves crisis receiving centers. And so first responders get anyone with a behavioral health condition it could be mental health solely, it could be substance use solely, or it could be the giant Venn diagram where they've got a little bit of both going on. Bring them into one location, and then the staff on site can kind of figure out, this is the best location for you. We're going to put you in this room, which is more with folks who are intoxicated, 
and or put you in the room with mental health. And they often offer the short-term stabilization, depending on the staffing model, nurse practitioners on site to actually provide medications to help people calm down if that's what they need. Uh, and they often take from the mobile crisis teams. There's a lot of work going on with police reform and a lot of different efforts to figure out how to work with crisis stabilization. And these services can use a sobering center as an alternative to jail or the psych emergency or psych urgent care for many of these individuals. And the last one I think I feature is the David L. Murphy in Los Angeles. I worked with them for a little while too. You can see the picture on the left. They had both because they also take from an ambulance situation and folks with wheelchairs can't get on the ground very easily, uh, especially if they transfer. So they had the higher pods for individuals who came in via wheelchair or using a walker so they can get into bed easier without getting so low to the ground. You can also see behind those yellow chairs, kind of right in the middle of your screen, is an individual room. So if someone comes in either with something presenting as a contagious situation, or they just don't want to be around a lot of other people in the dorm, many people do not, maybe the consumption that they have or their mental health, or they just want privacy. They can go into that individual room and it has a door that can shut if they want it to. Uh, and there are cameras in all the spaces, so there is no way to be unobserved. On the right hand side, you can kind of see the clinical station and there's windows all the way around uh, in that area. The one nice thing with them is, well, and some services have it, but Los Angeles has really hooked it up with super connection to their Department of Health Services down there and their homeless management services, very, very strong case management team, very strong peer professional team. Um, there's a gentleman, Ronald, who runs it and they are just rock stars. They have about a 20 to 25% rate for the users who come in, uh, who can who end up going to some level of treatment service or whatnot directly from the sobering center. Um, they also, this, the Exodus Recovery runs that sobering center and they are a mental health provider down in Los Angeles County. They run, they have a psych urgent care. So they can just, if they have someone that they're trying to get into another program, they can get them right over to the psych urgent care, get assessments done, get medications in hand, bring them back to the sobering center and then help transition them to say a mental health facility from that point on. On site, they can also do insurance applications, sign them up for Medicaid, uh, get housing applications and treatment services. I love them, they're amazing. Oh, and of course, a Houston Recovery. Uh, Houston Recovery, you can see they have the pod style um, there and their services, they can see they're doing a breathalyzer without one individual comes in the door. They have am amazing community collaborations, uh, public intoxication transport. They have an 18 month program that people who come into the sobering center can get signed up for, which is a treatment program, medication assisted treatment, et cetera. Um, and all their peers in that are certified peer recovery support service providers. The one I wanna do a shout out to here, especially with individuals with opiates, is they have an overdose response collaboration with the emergency department. And so individuals who have had an overdose and maybe need a reversal with a naloxone can be brought into the sobering center. They can also go to the emergency department, obviously. Sometimes they walk, a day, walk away because they've had so much naloxone, now they're in acute withdrawal. For those individuals who have had an overdose, someone from the sobering center works with the emergency department and will visit the person in the emergency department. And then they start doing follow-up with that individual immediately. And they'll call them in a day, call them in a week, and start doing engagement to help prevent future uh, overdoses. And they, are, they try to do it as long as humanly possible. And they also work with the first responders to recognize a potential overdose instead of something else going on. Um, the last one that is, I call it a sobering center. I'm not sure Dr. Jesse Data does or not, but this is the SPOT program in Boston. They are co-located with Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. Now for the medical providers in the room, just doing a shout out to those vital sign machines on your right hand side. You're looking at those blood pressures going 65 over 31 and a 90, why are they still sitting on this lazy boy in the middle of a sobering center? They are um, because they have perfected the art of the polysubstance use clinical management for folks who are using opiates. They have in Boston, and I haven't really seen it anywhere else. I haven't heard about it, but maybe it is a multi-drug cocktail. See it there, opiate, benzo, clonidine, phenergan, and gabapentin. Five of those together creates an individual who looks like they're having an overdose, extremely low blood pressure, can often have very, uh, very low pulse. And their oxygen will really depend obviously on the respiration status. So they do, they started basically doing a lot more naloxone at the beginning, but then slowly but surely realized we put them on oxygen, 
their oxygen saturation stays fine. They may or may not use naloxone. And if they do, it's a titration. So a quarter of a dose, not throwing them into withdrawal and they keep them on site. Fabulous thing with their program. They do a lot of work on stigma and they have found different than most other services, maybe because of the way that they work. Many of the individuals who come into their spot program, the supportive place for observation and treatment are women. So they have a high percentage of women and a lot of the work that they've been doing find that the women feel much safer being in this, this environment. They have been experiencing, and there's, this is anecdotal, obviously not, I don't have research on it, but I know they're looking into it. They're experiencing less assaults, less rapes by being uptunded in public, uptunded in encampments, et cetera. And they're in there in chairs and they're in a safe space and they're working with individuals who are helping them. Uh, another great thing that they have uh, been able to track or how many times someone visits their sobering center, their spot program, before they're willing to explore maybe another option. And they've found that on average, at least the numbers about a year or so ago, was it's on average 13 visits before the person's like, okay, I'll check out this buprenorphine thing that you're talking about. I'll, I'll check out Suboxone. And they will, and it's literally like, it's available down the hall. Their, their program, like you walk into the lobby, it's on the left-hand side, shaded in windows so you can't see what's in there and you just walk in the door and there's this little tiny room with a bunch of chairs in it like the picture I just showed you. Uh, but literally when you stand in the lobby on the left-hand side also is the pharmacy where you can go get buprenorphine, et cetera. This is absolutely amazing. Um, and so they've, they were hoping we'll be able to find more of this uh, in the research over the years. So I'm, I'm finishing probably a little bit early, but I'm gonna go through some closing thoughts here on where I fit with the sobering center stuff. So looking at the sobering center and the continuum of care, a lot of it kind of depends on the resources in the community, but the reality is, is this is a direct access. Individuals can come in. The beds are not, they're not flipped as quickly as they are in the emergency departments. They're not relying on insurance. So you're in a treatment program and your insurance only pays for 30 days of treatment, then you're kicked out of the program. Now, obviously this isn't something we're seeing for 30 days in a sobering center, but it's not like someone comes to the door and you're like, oh, but you visited yesterday. You can't come in today. That's not the case. I've, I have had folks come in three times in one day. Uh, there's, there's, I can alt tab to that later. There are considerations if someone is really, really ill that we wanna keep them in a situation that's as healthy as humanly possible. Um, but we basically don't say no. People come in, they're behaviorally appropriate. They're not throwing fisticuffs at the moment. Great, come on in. And even if someone does get upset, the work is on verbal de-escalation and getting the individual to hopefully stick around in a spot that we think is safer for them. Hopefully they're recognizing that. At the same time, if they're like, no, I wanna to go to the emergency department, they can go to the emergency department. If they wanna to go to jail, which I have 100% had people come in with law enforcement and the person's like, nope, I wanna to go to jail for whatever reason, they'll go to jail. Officers don't like it, but it'll happen. And we try to provide services that are basically aimed at the individual, figuring out what they want, what they need, who they are, uh, I, you get to know them. And I have gotten to know many of our clients. Many of our clients have gotten to know us. You know, they'll come in on a Friday night and they'll be like, where's so-and-so? That's their shift. They're like, it's their kid's birthday. So that's their kid's birthday party. And they're, you know, the person's like, oh, okay, okay. I wanted to see so-and-so tonight. They know what shifts we're on. So sometimes they'll come in and you're like, oh, so-and-so sick. And they'll be like, tell them I, you know, next time I see them, I'll, you know, give them a hug or whatever. Um, we get to know them, their birthdays, who their family members are, what their biggest issues are. And we really just focus on the idea that it's, it's harm reduction, client-centered, patient-centered, depending on which hat you're wearing, uh, and figuring out what they want. The actual where you fit them in is this uh, shout out to uh, Suzanne Jarvis, who is the uh, basically the data queen and guru over at Houston Recovery Center. Um, but they have, so we have kind of put this together, where sobering fits in when you're looking at, like SAMHSA has a mapping of where their con recovery continuum of care is. We fit in kind of in the intervention stage. So it's sobering centers fit in, not, we're not prevention per se, but we are prevention from future harm. So we're able to engage with that individual and get some good one-on-one -on -one with them about the harms of their use. Maybe there's something they can change next time they go out, uh, that type of thing. Or in this area in the middle, so you can see all the different community referral partners, we're giving them an alternative to bring people in. We're also providing education for the individual and screening, referrals to other services, et cetera. 
that can go directly into a treatment program or in recovery in general for linkages to a variety of different services. And as I mentioned earlier, an exit to the community could be to a service provider. It could be to their home. Many sobering centers, by the way, have vans, so we can actually drop people off uh, someplace else. But basically, that would be success. We've kept them out of other services that could cause more harm for them. A $2,000 emergency department bill, if it's an individual who doesn't have great insurance, a, another trip to the jail, which now makes them not eligible for other services, or puts them in court cases that they're not going to show up for because they're intoxicated in public, and they don't show up, and now they have warrants out, et cetera, et cetera. Last shout out. So one of the things that uh, the hat I wear is a, I run a nonprofit. Uh, so the National Sober and Collaborative, basically working for San Francisco Sober and, I was like, there's got to be more information out there. I went back to school to get my doctorate. So I have my doctorate in nursing to do basically research and why on Sober and Centers. And while I was there, I was like, I don't know anything about any other Sober and Centers. I'd heard of a couple, you know, I'd see it in the news or something. So I started reaching out. And yes, those slides will be available afterwards. I saw someone ask that question. Uh, and they have this, the, I was looking into other people. Who else was running sobering centers? Where are these programs? I figured out that nobody really knew anything about it. And so all of us just started hanging out together. And back in 2015, we, there was a conference in Seattle. I popped up there to visit and meet a few people. And then we started the collaborative. So uh, as of 2019, we're officially a 501c3 nonprofit. We get a small family foundation grant in last year. So I was able to hire a part-time. So we have an executive director now. And a lot of the work of the National Sobering Collaborative, especially for those of you who are looking at potentially starting a sobering center in your community, uh, we maintain a database of sobering centers in the US that is being updated right now. So it's a little outdated. It's about a year old. We're updating it currently with an intern from UCSF. Uh, and then we're looking at best practices, standards of care. Uh, we had a task force doing that, and we're currently uh, developing an accreditation program so that sobering centers can get accredited uh, and basically help legitimize the service and also provide standards. Because right now, if someone says they're running a sobering center or doing sobering care, they could really be doing anything uh, because there are no set standards. I'm not looking at licensing. I'm not looking at getting rid of the harm reduction, the low barrier, et cetera, but we're just trying to make it so that they have toilets that someone can use, that if someone's coming in wet clothing, that they have the capability to get them out of wet clothing, uh, that they are connected to services in the community and they are monitoring their clients, et cetera. And then we do a lot of work on uh, community collaborations. I have not said out loud yet, uh, community paramedicine, amazing. They are just absolutely amazing. A lot of law enforcement partners out there are trying to find ways of collaborating more around getting people out of the criminal justice system. So that is me. Um, these slides will be available, so you'll have that, but if you want to take a quick screenshot, feel free. Uh, that's my email address to get me. Um, I have a website which has some downloadable stuff, uh, and we're also redoing the National Sober and Collaborative website right now. We do have some things online there, uh, if you look at it, that you can download. And I am going to stop sharing. And I took that picture, by the way, so it's, I, I don't have a photo credit up there just because I happen to take that picture. So I stopped sharing, and hopefully... Everybody can hear me, and then I will turn it back over to Liz and or Ashley, and we'll go for Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Smith Fernand, and that was fantastic, uh, so insightful. Uh, we do have two questions in the Q&A, and before I do that, I just want to uh, remind everyone that the evaluation um, is available. It's been added into the, the chat. We do want your feedback from today's session. And, and Dr. Smith Fernand, and there were some comments as you were speaking. Um, so in terms of where people have visited, someone did mention Austin, Texas. Someone said that they have not visited one, but would like would like to, and I believe they want to um, find one in New York State. I believe that's what it was. And um, someone else had mentioned we have a sobering up center healing transitions in Raleigh, um, North Carolina, and we welcome any visitors. And um, just just the idea that this is such a, a great idea and beautiful and humane concept. So I, I think this is just I've been so powerful to, to learn more about this today. Uh, going into our Q and A, uh, first question: What does typical staffing look like in these centers? Staffing, that's a great question. So staffing is a, if I was going to recommend a program do staffing, because based on what's mostly being used, it's a mix of peer professionals, peer specialists, and emergency medical technicians, EMTs. The EMTs can do the vital signs and help for emergencies, et cetera, like that. 
beautiful thing with the emergency medical technicians is in addition to being, they, they basically follow certain guidelines. They can recognize an emergency, they can send someone to 911 and they can have a bit of a medical conversation as they needed to if they had to call somebody. Um, but they also are a little bit less expensive. So many communities are nonprofits who are running sobering centers. And so they don't have a big budget. All the way up to San Francisco, uh, Austin, Texas, Los Angeles, lots of have a mix of paramedics or so EMT P's paramedics or registered nurses or licensed vocational nurses. And with the nursing aspect and the paramedic aspect, if you're going to take from ambulances, typically across the country, ambulances have to drop off to an equivalent level of care or higher. So they can drop off paramedic to paramedic, paramedic to LVN or RN to physician. That's why they can go to the emergency departments. I think that's the case in every state. If it's not, I'd still probably recommend it for still brain centers, but I don't want to put that in a you know, nail in it on that one. But that's pretty much what the main ones is. Then other sobering centers will augment with case managers, patient navigators, uh, certified or um, registered chemical dependency workers or mental health professionals. For example, San Jose that I featured, they had the red lazy boy chairs. With all of the mental health clients that they're getting in, they're starting to try to figure out more to get in either psych technicians and or uh, a social worker, they're bringing in a social worker very soon, actually a licensed clinical social worker to engage with the individuals on a higher level. And so that would be the staffing, I'll stop at that. And another question, what kind of funding or where does the funding come from? Oh, so funding is a mixed bag. That's one of the other reasons why we're trying to work on the accreditation program. So funding at the moment is, let's see here. It is a combination typically of what a nonprofit would typically see. So city and county funding is the top amount, top funding right now. So individual cities or counties will be chipping in to help run the sobering center. Law enforcement has been a lot of the funding towards it. So Santa Cruz uh, used to have a sobering center in California. They're starting a new one sometime soon. Half of theirs came from a budget, the Edwin Byrne Justice uh, budget, which I think is common across either the state or the country. Uh, so many law enforcement will do that. States have now started stepping in. Stepping in. Uh, the Mental Health Services Act and HSA uh, are starting to pay for sobering centers. With that, a lot of folks are nonprofit, they're getting family foundation grants, et cetera. What has been really promising is in California right now, and I know California, we always do weird stuff, but we also do some great stuff too. Uh, with our Medicaid reform, there's a huge Medicaid reform going on kept called CalAIM. They've created a section of it called community supports, uh, which includes medical respite, medical shelter, folks who are homeless, uh, enhanced case management services, street outreach teams, and sobering centers. And so with Medicaid, it's going to be able to put funding through Medicaid to pay for sobering centers to be operated. Uh, we're very interested to see how this is going to happen. We have at the moment 14 sobering centers in California. 38 counties out of 58 have opted in now to start a sobering center based on this funding that's going to come through Medicaid. So that right now is very promising. With that, there has been conversation on the federal level with leadership from California, some other states who have been watching this and figuring out there's a way that Medicaid in general across the country, we call it Medi-Cal here, but in Medicaid in general could incorporate some level of community supports, which would include sobering centers as being paid for. Not sure if it's gonna be a fee for service thing. Some are looking at like every time someone comes to the sobering center and they have Medicaid or Medicare, then they get a reimbursement for that. So it won't necessarily be a chunk of money. I'm kind of hoping for a chunk of money to go into that, but that's currently how they're funded. Uh, I had a paper out of California that when we looked at a qualitative review in anticipation of CalAIM, uh, and it had, goes into more specifics on the actual funding um, resources, which I don't know if I put it anywhere, but I can share it. And then, yeah. One more question. Uh, what are some good first steps to advocate for sobering centers in our community? I'm currently in Chicago and I'm not sure if there is one there, but I'd be interested in advocating for one if not. Yes. Oh, that's great. Is, is it your pronounce your name Scotia? And I know you can't unmute. I'm sorry. I, if I just butchered the name, I apologize, but I love it. It's, it's a fabulous name. Um, so, with, uh, so, yes, Chicago. And I only know that because I met with them three weeks ago. Uh, so, Chicago is working on a sobering center. Uh, 
advocating for it. Uh, if you reach out to me directly, I can probably, I, I, I can't give you the phone number of the lady who's running the whole thing because that would probably be breaking some level of confidentiality. However, in your, to answer the bigger question, it, the most places now are using the phrase sobering center. Uh, and so you can, I have a Google alert set up. So every time something comes up, working with the community meetings. Um, so a couple of ways to advocate for it. If you, if you are interested in or go to community meetings currently, just feel free to swing by one and bring this up as an option so that the community members hear it from some another community member first. Because what has been happening is someone finds out about this through me somehow, like a conference like this, it goes to someone in the board of supervisors or goes to the head of the Department of Public Health and then they all start doing these great plans and they show up six months later at a community meeting and say, hey, we've got this great idea. And the community members are like, you didn't come to us first. We didn't hear about it first. We don't want it. Um, I've literally been spit on at meetings, um, going to community meetings, trying to advocate for a sobering center. And so people are pretty harsh. I think the other thing you can do to advocate for is talk about the realities of a sobering center, which you haven't necessarily visited one. Some of you who, who have, it's fabulous. Um, we have my coffee just got delivered. I'm very excited right now. Um, we just had, um, we've had a few meetings at different areas talking about the benefits of a sobering center and the differences between a shelter, the differences between, and I'm not saying other these things are bad. I, I, I work in the shelter system also. It's just that there's what has happened in the country is shelters that were created as emergency response for people who are suddenly homeless and we're trying to get them back in have turned into long-term situations where people live there. And then all their friends come and visit and everyone's like, oh my God, I don't want this in my community because I'm gonna have 50 people hanging outside a building all day long. That doesn't happen with sobering centers. People don't hang out outside. I've never seen it. I've never heard of it. Um, you can advocate for security being outside. Like most of the sobering centers I've worked with, they don't have security. You don't need it. We can de-escalate people verbally. Uh, people who are intoxicated are not violent by nature. Their people become aggressive or violent because people treat them badly. Uh, usually the PCP can cause all kinds of things. Um, and so can bath salts. So I'm, I'm putting that as a little out tab. Um, but basically these are situations where the community members are scared of something they don't know about. Send, getting them information that this is a program that help gets people connected to services is one way to do it, but I would just say community meetings are a good way to do it. Saying hi, I know those might not be the best things in the world. I rarely go to my own community meetings, even though I should, maybe because we already have a sobering center, so I don't really worry about it as much. I'm, uh, I'm on the East Bay side of things over in Oakland, so um, that's where I'm hailing them from today. Hopefully that answered your question, but feel free to th throw in some more thoughts. Um, I'd love to hear it. Uh, I do see another question in the Q&A. Are there any sobering centers coming to the city of Las Vegas? That is a fabulous question. So there is a nurse practitioner in Vegas who I chatted with right before the pandemic. So in 2019, and they were very interested. I met with them a few times. Uh, so with the National Sobering Collaborative, by the way, we have calls on the first Friday of every month. There's one today at noon Pacific, so three o'clock Eastern, uh, which we have a gentleman from Breakin in Boston coming. So we have monthly meetings where people can come and learn about sobering centers, where we usually have a presentation by a sobering center and anyone's welcome to come. Um, so just let me know if you wanna be added to that list. With Las Vegas, no. Other than this one individual was trying to start it, they were trying to figure it out. I did get a call from a gentleman who was trying to start a for-profit bus so he could pick up the kids with credit cards and give my IVs and I forget what he was gonna call it. And I didn't actually help that individual because I'm not a big fan of the whole for-profit model. Let's take advantage of kids because he was gonna charge them $500 to give them a banana bag of, of you know, stuff. Uh, and so I was not excited about that. That's all I've heard about. Vegas needs one desperately, um, but they, I have not heard of that happening yet. So, uh, so yes. What other questions? I saw a bunch of stuff coming in the chat. I could talk about serving centers all day long. So, or we could, you know, end early. So, um, and then, and I will put, I know my email is at that very end thing, but I'll see if I can put my email on the chat too. So if you want to reach out, Mm. So that's an easy one to get a hold of me. Um, so yeah, perfect. And I can, for those of you who get put the email in the chat, I can do that right away. And if you email these guys back, just email me. Oh, any centers in rural areas? I see a question from Jane. That is, yes, there are ones that are starting. That is a huge issue. We're hoping actually in 
what month are we in? We're in March. Either April or May, we're going to focus our first Friday conversation on rural because that comes up a lot. We don't, one of the issues that I see with starting a sober and center rural, not an issue of starting a sober and center, I think it's a fantastic idea, is what else does the population need there? What did, what did they, what else is very, very present? Because if you're going to start a sober and center, the, one of the main goals and one of the main benefits of one is to connect people to services that exist in the community. And if the resources that exist in the community are nil, then we probably want to start a robust sobering center that's co-located with a street medicine team with a working with individuals who are, are homeless. Maybe uh, have the beds, half of them dedicated to detox and sobering or medical respite so they can get medical care and they can stay overnight and maybe stay for a week because they're seen in the hospital. So that is the main consideration I have with rural sobering centers is that what are you connecting them to? Because one visit to a sobering center is not going to make someone stop drinking. It might. I, I honestly have had people who have called or emailed us or shown up a year after their very first and only sobering center visit, literally the one year chip and been like, I went to AA starting the day after this and I got sober because I was so scared. That is an anomaly. Um, and so I would say working with the individuals, if maybe in a rural environment, if it's sobering center is the only thing you have, then you want to incorporate more of a social worker on staff there versus relying on transferring them or referring them to an outside party. So, and, oh, and so there's no sorting center. So I see the anonymous, are there any residence restrictions? No sorting, can I receive services in a different kind of state? So if you happen to be in Austin and you're at South by Southwest and you get intoxicated, yes, you totally go to the sobering center there and you're not gonna be penalized in any manner and you'll definitely be allowed to go into them. Um, I've had folks who on their way to the airport get intoxicated on the subway because they're scared of flying and they end up bringing them in to the sobering center. Um, and so, yeah, it's, and visiting from out of the country. I've had folks who are just in San Francisco visiting out of the country in Los Angeles and they get brought to the sobering center. Uh, and many sobering centers are created for the community that they're in. The David L. Murphy that was featured in the photos, they're in Skid Row. The anticipation is the vast majority of individuals who will be served there are individuals who are experiencing homelessness at the same time or live in the community in Skid Row versus someone who's going to the airport because they're kind of far away from that. Um, other sobering centers like Austin, Texas, definitely being one, San Diego, California, are aimed at the visitor who's coming into the area, who's there for an event, who's there for a party, et cetera. Um, yeah, and Alexis, I would love to see one in Las Vegas. Uh, actually, last time I was in Vegas was right before the pandemic and ended up having to do a response with a poor gentleman who was too intoxicated on the sidewalk. He couldn't walk and his friends were there and they were trying to pour water on him to sober up. And I was like, okay, stop. Like, let's, let's do a real sobering response on the sidewalk right now. And we managed to get a car and managed to get him back someplace safe. So it was, uh, it desperately needs one. College campuses is a great question. Po questions are going to keep coming in. If you can just hang with me, Liz, if you want to, I'm cool with that. Um, so there are efforts around this. So Certain communities have started, I think USF was one that I was working with, that they may, they don't necessarily have a sobering center, but they can have uh, like an area where kids can be brought in. And I, I use kids loosely, whoever's on campus, um, the kids loosely into these areas, but they have what's really amazing is EMT programs on the campus. And so the, the students can learn to become emergency medical technicians, and then they run a student run EMT response to fraternities, to a dorm. So it's a safe area that the students can call and have student-run EMT programs show up at their dorm with less fear of getting in trouble for everyone's been drinking too much and the kids get a safe response. We, I would love to see a whole branch come out for that. I am going to look at the time. It's 30 seconds left or whatever, a minute left. So I'm going to hand off to Liz. Uh, and please email me. I have lots of time to talk. If it's okay, we did get one last question in the chat um, from Tiffany. Are pop-up sobering centers a thing for anticipated high volume of need, like for big events and areas to bolster support? Yes, and we, uh, I have done many of those. They're amazing. So we can pop up. Uh, it basically depends. The staffing can be similar to a sobering center. For pop-up events, I would say, so there's organizations, like if you look up RockMed, uh, R-O-C-K-M-E-D. They, those are hired organizations that can come in. They often work with volunteers. I have, uh, I have volunteered with those type of organizations in the past, not with RockMed itself, but other ones. If you're gonna do the staffing for this, one thing you're gonna see is gonna be, there is going to be a higher rate of alcohol poisoning potential for youth who are drinking. Uh, and 
if it's going to be a large scale event, like they had love fest or pride, and you're anticipating lots of kids under the age of 18, I would work to get a pediatric specialist on site because you, you're going to end up transferring everyone to the emergency department, unless you get a pediatric specialist on site and you can put people with IVs in these pop-up sobering centers. Uh, we, uh, we've done them a lot, find that vast majority of the time, it's either kids under 18 or kids who are very young, who are under 25, who this is a major binge drinking event for them, or the first time that they've had this much ecstasy or something like that. And they're just kind of really out there and they could use a little help coming, either coming down, being reoriented or getting IV fluids because they are vomiting so much, they will not be able to take in uh, fluids and will have alcohol poisoning. And so that is a big consider for pop-ups. It's the binge drinking. So but it's lovely, reach out to me on that one too. I can help out, yeah. So uh, with that said, we are at time, but once again, Dr. smith Brennan, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, for providing this information. I also wanna thank our participants for once again joining us this month. Uh, as a reminder, the uh, webinar series will continue through September. Our next session is Bridging HIV and Substance Use Disorder, Innovations in the Field and Syringe Services Programs in Rural Communities. This will be on Friday, April 7th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, Ashley did drop the registration link in the chat. So please, uh, we hope that you will join us for the next session and we wish everyone a fabulous day. Thank you. Thank you all.